Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Kier Gilchrist, an actor you may know from the TV series United States of Tara and Atypical, or from films like It's Kind of a Funny Story, It Follows, and Katie Says Goodbye. He co-stars with Alex Wolfe and Imogen Poots in Joey Klein's new drama Castle in the Ground, which is now available on digital and on demand in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, It's really good and you should see it. Kier picked Cave of Forgotten Dreams, Werner Herzog's 3D exploration of the perfectly preserved 32,000-year-old paintings discovered in the Chauvet Cave in France. To prevent damage or deterioration, the French Ministry of Culture prohibits civilians from entering the cave, but Herzog was allowed to accompany a team of archaeologists, meaning his film is the closest most of us will ever come to visiting the site. It's an essential historical document, and since it's a Werner Herzog film, it's also idiosyncratic and a little weird. One small note, this is another episode with less than optimal audio, but I think it's worth the effort. This is someone else's movie. Well, um, I mean, I've been a massive fan of everything Werner Herzog's done since I was uh, a kid, basically. Um, I can't remember exactly which was the first film I saw of his, maybe Aguirre, Wrath of God. Mm. Um, but my parents got me into Herzog and, uh, he's always just been, I mean, it's, you know, especially nowadays when you have so much selection in terms of what to watch, whenever I see that name, I just get so excited and I jump right in. And then on top of that, um, I'm fascinated by the ice age and, uh, the Pleistocene and prehistoric, uh, humans and the cave paintings. I actually have a tattoo of one of those paintings on my chest. Wow. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and I've always just had this, I, I read a lot about what's known about prehistory. Um, so, and like megafauna and kind of the relationship between humans and prehistoric creatures. And I think I've always had a real affinity for the mammals, mainly because a lot of them, our ancestors actually interacted with and laid eyes on themselves. Um, so there's this weird kind of, uh, fascination I've had with the idea that these magnificent beasts existed alongside humans so it's sort of more close to home than in dinosaurs even though I like all that stuff too but sure. then you know of course uh, when you know Herzog made a movie about my favorite subject it was kind of like the meeting of my two favorite possible uh, things so I went to see it in theaters in 3D and another thing that's interesting about it too is that I hate 3D usually it gives me a headache and it makes me fall asleep mm-hmm. um, or one or the other, I guess. Um, and this, I felt like was the best use of that medium uh, that I've ever seen. Yeah. I can I would, probably say it's the only 3d film that I actually enjoy. So. I can make the same argument. Yeah. It's um, it was really quite striking. I saw it at TIFF uh, when it, when it played here in I guess 2011, maybe. And um uh, it was, oh no, sorry, I'm double checking. It was 2010. It was, it was actually the same year that you were here with um, Kind of a Funny Story, if I've got that right. Oh, that's funny. I didn't even put the two and two together either. I, I know I saw it, I think, with my dad. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't even put two and two together that that was the same year. Yeah, yeah. And it's, got it. that's 10 years ago, the last time we saw each other. How, how, how have you been? Everything's yeah, been? I know. Was that the last time? Yeah, no, I've, I think I've been, so. I've been great. I mean, yeah. No, I, I really have no complaints. Obviously, we're in the situation we are right now, and yeah. um, isolation is a huge privilege that I get to engage in. Um, and so, yeah, I really cannot complain right now. Um, but yeah, no, I, I can't believe it's been that long. Yeah, no, it's time just flies right by. Um, but I remember we it was screened for the press at, I think it was like an 11 o'clock a.m. screening in one of the Scotiabank rooms, and I have to admit, I was skeptical Skeptical going in. It was one of those things that you have to wear 3D glasses to see a documentary that just felt gimmicky. And then within five minutes of the first shots of the caves, it just all fell into place. It was transporting. It was what he wanted it to be. You know, closest thing to actually being there, right? Since it's now not possible for people to, for civilians to go wander around. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, with most, most art, you have a flat canvas. Um, and uh, it's the actual curvatures uh, of the cave play so much into the way that the art can be perceived mm-hmm. from, um, you know, your eyes. So it, it really felt 
accurate. It's also partly why I chose to get it tattooed on my chest too, is because there's natural, you know, curvature and um, these very organic kind of 3D lines. And so it kind of popped in my head that I went, oh, you know, that would actually look really cool on flesh. So, um, yeah, but I think, again, I'm, I've never been a fan of 3D. Mostly I just want to leave as soon as I put the glasses on. It's uncomfortable. Um, but this actually properly earned it. Um, so, yeah, no, it's uh, easily one of my favorite documentaries. And it's an eccentric documentary, too, because as much as the showcase of the, the caves is the reason it exists, Herzog's going to be Herzog, and he can't not insert himself. I, it feels to me as though his... His focus is such when he's making a movie that he, his mind wanders in the most interesting ways. I, I, I love waiting for the distractions and the digressions in his films, um, just because as important as the subject is, the only time I think he's, he's in recent years that he's stayed all the way through on point was Into the Abyss, where he was, you know, the, the material is so somber and serious that there's simply no place for him to wander off. But with this he opens the door to this meditation on who we are as a species, where we've, where we've been, where we're going and and this collective dream space where art lives. And it, it is just, I remember just having my breath taken away by realizing that whoever drew this, whoever painted this 33,000 years ago had a better sense of perspective and form than I do. Um, we, we imagine ourselves to be better than the, the, the hominids or whatever. I mean, they were humans in, in, in that era, but you know what I mean? There, there, there's this arrogance of people who live in the present day, whatever the present is, whatever you are, you're the peak of human evolution. And then just to see real art expressed in a manner that I just would not have imagined possible at that age, at that point in time, was just stunning. And that's the thing is, is how little we've actually changed. I mean, our brains haven't changed much from that point. And you know, we have this idea of permanence, that the way that we live and, you know, civilization and all of this is this, you know, rock solid foundation that isn't going anywhere. And if you think about it, our species lived like that for much, much, much longer yeah. than uh, we've lived the way we do now. I mean, it's a, almost a blink in the eye of even just our history, let alone the planet's history. Um, and, and to know that, yeah, I mean, tens of thousands of years we lived alongside these animals and, um you know, also just the idea that, yeah, people have this kind of idea about cave people, that they were these, you know, unsophisticated people. And it's like, I, I would like to see any modern person try and go out and survive in that environment. And then also not even that thrive in that environment enough to the point where you can actually make art. Um, but yeah, it's actually interesting too, with the Into the Abyss, because I love that film too. Um, and I probably, the, in my opinion, my crowning achievement in my career is I got to sit down with Herzog once <laughs> for an hour to talk about a movie that um, I was potentially going to do a role in. And I, it was like my second callback or something. And they said that Herzog just wanted to talk. And I was like, you know, I've never been so nervous for anything that I've done in my career. Um, and uh, we were supposed to be talking about the film at hand, but we ended up just basically talking about all of it and he had just finished into the abyss and um i could tell that movie really talked took a lot out of him he really spoke about it in a way that i could tell it was it was sort of a change for him and it was a different way of doing a film and that it really kind of hurt him to to get that close to the subject and 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 like you said kind of not insert himself um but yeah overall that whole interview was amazing because i just basically kept encouraging him to tell me stories <laughs> while the casting director who was present kept trying to steer it back to the subject at hand and then he would start talking about you know fifth Corraldo and shooting that and i'd be like yes please tell me more and yes he kept trying to rein it in but it was like probably my favorite conversation i've ever had oh. with uh, anybody in this industry so um yeah I, that was yeah. many years ago and the movie never ended up happening but yeah no i know exactly what that feels like i interviewed him when he came through with uh, the bad lieutenant film and you know it was it was Werner herzog and nicholas cage in a in a suite at um I forget where it was. It was probably the Intercontinental or, you know, one of the one of the TIFF uh, hotels. And the surrealism of having Nicolas Cage start talking about performance as a musical scale and then how it related to leaving, how this film relates to leaving Las Vegas and The Wicker Man together and then just having him shoot a look across to Herzog, who was on a different couch elsewhere in the room talking to somebody else and just the sense that they got each other in their, in their eccentricities and whatever else. You know, the, obviously... 
people who do this professionally, people who become a persona professionally, publicly, the way that Cage and, and Herzog have, have a sort of an armor around them, a detachment to, to allow that to become their public thing. Whoever they really are, we're still not fully seeing it. But then I got this other moment with, with Herzog when we were talking about the use of animals in Bad Lieutenant and how he just, um, he loves the idea of nature judging humans and how nothing we do matters and it's all, you know, callous indifference in the, in the natural world. But the, those little moments with the, the New Orleans jazz number and the iguanas, oh, just, it made him so happy to put it in the film, to talk about it, and to have Cage be on, on point with it. And, and I got this sense, this this sort of bristling creative joy where I don't know that he knows how he does it, but he follows his instincts every time, and they just end up finding these strange moments of beauty or transcendence or just pure silliness, and it all comes from the same consciousness. So, yeah, I completely understand. Like, you got an hour with him? I was, at the, I was there for maybe 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I got an hour, and, I mean, we kind of talked about the film that we were supposed to be potentially doing but it quickly just took a turn and much like his films do and it kind of just <laughs> sidetracked and we just started talking and which is also valid i mean that's part of the point of a general meeting too sure. um is to see if you get each other and i think he appreciated that i appreciated the things he had to say um and uh then how could i not because it was just the most hilarious fantastic stories but um yeah no there's just something and I, I, there's this weird calming thing about just even hearing his voice recorded and then to hear it in real life it's like i don't know it's just very relaxing and i don't know it's just it, it was a very surreal moment for sure oh that's lovely and i wonder if this isn't how he gets his movies made simply pitching them uh the same way he narrates them just telling you that everything is going to make sense and it's going to there will be a story that you will find the kernel of whatever it is that he's working on yeah it's interesting there's a, there's a, a certain quality that i think you know i've worked with a lot of directors now over the 17 years that i've been doing this Mm -hmm. and um and all function differently and successfully in their own ways but there really is nothing like finding a director who just has this confidence and calming presence where you just you kind of just give into it and just let go and realize okay this person knows exactly what they're doing and i mean it kind of remind me of uh that reminds me of it follows because again we were all kind of like scratching our heads on set in terms of a lot of these details that david um, decided to to include and you know clearly David had this kind of mystical quality that you know was sort of like a shaman that you were all just realized after a few weeks you had to go you know what let's just shut up and trust that David knows exactly what he's doing because it may not make sense to us now but um, you know there's just something about him where you just knew and then of course you saw the film at the end of it and we're like okay yeah that makes sense I'm glad that I trusted him um yeah, yeah it's I'm, definitely a very unique quality, you know. Well, so much of it follows depends on the execution, right? Because if you're on set, you have no idea how it's going to cut together or where the, or even how the angle of a given shot is going to influence the audience's expectation. Like more than most, I think that film really depends on a confidence behind the camera and, and, a, and a, 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 like a momentum that builds from storytelling. And Herzog definitely has that. Like he, he knows how to set up jokes in documentaries, which no one else does, where he'll just sort of let you find the point in the little, the little moment of comedy or the little, the little laugh that he's, he's built in with his skepticism in a line reading or something. I, I've, I, that's an almost alchemical aspect to his filmmaking, where I've, I've wondered often how people discover him now, because he's become a sort of cult figure. I mean, obviously, the just the fact that he appears in Parks and Rec in its final season means that there was a sense that enough of America would get the joke of the strange man popping up and being silly and then casting him in The Mandalorian, which sounded like a huge leap, but actually made perfect sense. It, who he is now is not who he was in the 70s and 80s when he was making these movies by the skin of his teeth. And watching him evolve into this position over the mid-period of his career is, is the stuff that really interests me. The American films that don't quite work or, or some that really, really land... And then the documentaries, which just never vary, they're always, they're always coming from this one place, this man who just wants to know more about everything he points his camera at. And, and maybe he makes judgments about why people do what they do, but the mystery of, of his discovery, the exploration, it comes back in, in Cave of Forgotten Dreams, it comes back in Encounters at the End of the World, which is the other one I always cling to, where he just injects himself into a place where he has no business being and somehow makes us see it through his eyes. It's just incredible what he does. 
Yeah, no, it's it's wild, and, and it's actually interesting too. I don't know if you've ever seen. There's this weird movie that I never hear anyone talk about that I love. That it's called Incident at Loch Ness. Oh yeah, um, yeah yeah yeah. And he, uh, I mean, he's playing himself in the film. Um, and that whole film is such a weird, I think, overlooked, strange, meta kind of thing that, like, it's a weird monster movie that's really just about Herzog, but it's not directed. And it's like, he, I don't know, he plays himself, and it's like a caricature of himself, but then it kind of makes you question, is that what he's doing all the time in public? Oh, yeah. Um, or is that truly who he is? And, um, I mean, I think even just the bravery to make that film, how many directors can say <laughs> that they made, they decided to say yes to playing themselves in a weird monster movie that um that blows open all these you know rumors about his his previous career and i don't know it's, i just I, i've just been so fascinated by him everything that i've seen that even is attached to him even if he didn't produce it or write it or whatever it's just always an extra layer you know it's just always makes it more and more interesting yeah, I reviewed Incident at Loch Ness when it came out, and it was one of those things where I could not explain it to anybody. I was just saying, no, you really just, if you if you have any interest in this, you should go see it. And I wonder now, it's been 16, 17 years, maybe enough time has passed that it could resurface in some edition where people take it absolutely seriously, because there's, other than that one really obvious shot of an effect, there's nothing that says that it didn't happen. Like, it's, it's so strangely credible. I can imagine a, a Blair Witch situation happening around it. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I remember just seeing it, being blown away, probably watching it ten times or so, which I'm, I do, you know, I really, I'm super picky, but when I find something I like, I'll watch it over and over and over again, um, and then yeah, just having found almost no one since then who has seen it, um, at least in my general, like my immediate, sorry, my immediate circle, really haven't ever found anyone that knows about that movie. Um, yeah. But I think it's such a special little weird gem and uh yeah no it's cool that you actually reviewed it like yeah <laughs> yeah it had the misfortune to arrive just as the midnight uh cycle was dying down i think you know like even five years earlier it would have never gone away it would have just been this cult sensation it'd be playing at the new beverly every third friday or something yeah no i i and i think yeah like you're saying maybe there is room here for some kind of resurgence and i think it's interesting because as as uh streaming has made stuff you know, content so much more accessible for people. I've noticed people's tastes kind of changing and people who maybe didn't see many more films than a few of you that were, you know, in cinemas at their local cineplex or, yeah, or yeah. that's a Canadian thing. But yeah, um, all of a sudden I think people's tastes have really changed and kind of evolved. And I think people are able to, people that wouldn't have before can all of a sudden kind of really understand how special a movie like that is. Yeah. And the, the sense of discovery, I guess I keep waiting for it. It hasn't really happened where everybody's sort of retreating back to comfort food and familiar stuff. Maybe it's, we got to wait another month before it gets really experimental. But it's exactly the sort of film that would benefit from being passed around in the darkness, like just this link that shows up in your inbox and you have a, a movie to watch. I don't even know where to find it because I know my dad has gotten a DVD whenever it came out and that's the only copy I've ever uh, had, but um, yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of, which I understand, it's a traumatic experience, you know, experience for everyone, and people want to just go watch, you know, popcorn stuff um, and rewatch things. And I mean, I think we're all guilty of that to some degree. Um, sure, sure. But uh, yeah, I, I think it is interesting. I, I think uh, it, it might be a good time to, for people to challenge themselves more and, and really try and explore what's out there because, again, there's really nothing stopping you. It's like, you know, um, but I get it. I get it that everyone's pretty stressed right now. And um, But personally speaking, I, I actually find it more relaxing to get into uh, kind of obscure and maybe hard to watch stuff. It actually makes me feel better about my own situation. Oh, yeah. um, it's the same kind of with music. You know, I've always really liked sort of challenging music to listen to. And so a lot of my friends will be like, oh, I've just been, you know, listening to this this album on repeat that makes me feel good. And I've been like, oh, I've been delving into the depths of uh, depressive black metal <laughs> and, uh, you know, obscure, whatever, like stuff like that. But that, that that's just my own thing. It makes me comfortable. So I can see the appeal. I mean, I, I totally understand the retreat to comfort stuff, which is exactly what I did, but yeah, we should all be doing that right now. You're right. That's, it's a good use of the time we have. 
Yeah, I mean, it's definitely easier said than done, but I've, I've definitely found myself, you know, at least setting aside half a day here and there and going like, okay, let's do a little exploring until <laughs> 5 p.m. or whatever, and, and then I can go back to, you know, listening to and watching the things I want or, you know, I mean, like, uh, even I've got a big bookshelf in my library and I'm like, okay, now's the time to get through. I've been collecting books that I haven't, like that book there has been sitting there for four years still haven't cracked it time to plow through it and then um see how much of this i can get done you know at least with my first half of the day or whatever and then towards bed i can just whatever hang out but when was the last time you revisited cave of forgotten dreams do you get back to it often or is it something that you hold in reserve i think i've probably seen it six times um i, I again it's it's kind of for me it's just one of the perfect films it, it, it kind of satisfies multiple uh, fascinations of mine, but um, I think the last time was when I showed my girlfriend because she wasn't as familiar with her talk stuff. So when we started dating, um, obviously we were showing each other stuff, and and uh, I I had to show her a bunch of her talk. I think that was the last time. So maybe like two or three years ago, was the okay. last time I watched that film. How did it play for her? Did she enjoy it? Was it? Did you? Were you able? Yeah, to Yeah, yeah, totally. She was down. <laughs> I mean, again, maybe you know, maybe she's not quite as obsessed with the ice age with me, but, um, she definitely, you know, enjoyed it. And I think, uh, has, you know, really loved all the Herzog stuff I've shown her, but I think, uh, yeah, uh, the fact that it's a realm of interest that doesn't necessarily appeal to her and she was still, uh, engaged, I think said something too about his ability to tell a story because for a lot of people, I mean, I start talking about these subjects that I have these weird fascinations with history. I read a lot of history books and, um, I try and explain these things to people and I see sometimes people's eyes blaze over and I totally understand that. But um, it's almost like, well, hey, listen, I know I'm not really selling this, but let, let Herzog explain it to you and I'm pretty sure um, it'll change your opinion and you'll find something there. So, um, yeah, she really liked it. No, that's good. I mean, it's true. He is a great guide to things just in general, even if it's, um, uh, I keep thinking about the volcanoes and the and the fascination he had. He made two films or he brought two films to TIFF one year. Uh, one was the um, uh, was Salt and Fire, the drama he made with Michael Shannon. And then the other one was the Volcano documentary, the title of which escapes me uh, just a second. But I saw them basically back to back on the same day and thought, he just, his, I can understand where both of these films came from. I preferred one vastly over the other, but there, there's a sense that he's just tugging at something that he had. If he didn't make this movie, it would bother him forever. And you get yeah, that. Yeah, with... I agree. I mean, I'm not even, yeah, I, I, I think about it too. I always say this to people. I go, I wonder how many films her dog has over the years that are just unfinished, just yeah. sitting somewhere in his house, you know, like these, these ideas, because he just seems to just grab an idea and, and chase it. And I yeah. just wonder to myself, how many like lost her dog films are there where he just didn't quite, get enough footage or enough information and maybe just put it to bed for a while. And I just feel like he must have like 40 films that are just unfinished somewhere in his house. It will be the subject of like a heist movie somewhere down the line about five or six other films that he I'd just... feel it. Exactly. You're putting a crew together. That's how this works. Uh, what was the last one he... The last thing I saw... Oh, the, the Bruce Chatwin doc, uh, Nomad. An unlikely film for him because... It seems like such a small story to tell. It's barely worthy of a of a, a feature length running time, but he makes it so moving. This this remembrance of a friend who's been dead for thirty years and how that man's work ties into his own. It's just such a strange conviction to think. Oh, I can tell this. I can tell this story as a film. Like this this anecdote or dinner party story is now a feature because he found a way whatever it yeah you're right I'd, I'd be very curious to see the films he doesn't finish and how long they are like how much footage he shoots before he abandons something or if he ever does maybe he'll just finish something else 10 years down the road that he started last week yeah no i mean i just can't i can't imagine that he doesn't have you know it just seems like he'll just get an idea and then just buy a plane ticket and like grab a you know grab a few a small crew and just go and i can't imagine that he hasn't started a bunch that he just wasn't able to finish because even just finishing any documentary is a huge feat um but i yeah i i could only imagine that there's a fault of stuff just sitting there that maybe he hasn't quite figured a way to put together but 
um, yeah, I mean, it's something that's always fascinating to me about documentary in general. It's just this whole putting a puzzle together, I think, is so impressive. You know, just shoot, 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 and then figure out some way to tell a story. Um, yeah, it's really it's something I, I've always dreamed of maybe if we got the right, you know, subject. I would totally love to try and direct something like that one day. But yeah. We shall see. Is there anything that you would want to commit that much of your life to, to capturing and explaining? I've always been afraid that if I ever make a doc, it'll be something that I'm just casually interested in rather than something I have to stop doing everything else in my life in order to focus on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll get on the subject every once. I mean, my girlfriend tells me constantly, she'll just be like, why are you telling me this and not finding a way to tell other people about this? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I understand, I understand, but I also just realized that commitment like you were saying that, that it would take um uh but it's definitely tempting i mean i definitely have thought about doing something uh around the music that i'm into uh i think because i just happen to be part of this very underground subgenre and uh it's very specific and i don't think it's ever really been properly portrayed um in general i think uh i think you know punk rock and metal have but i listen to this very kind of extreme uh subgenres that that exist in there and um i've definitely had the desire to do that um but it's also just hard i, I guess you know being an actor on top of everything because you're just so out of control of your schedule sure that it just feels like so often i'll get involved in something and then you know it's you know that's that classic thing like if you want to work book a vacation right <laughs> like yeah you know, if you you book a vacation, you'll definitely not be able to finish it or you'll have to come back early and not even go. So um, it's been something. But I think this whole situation we're in now has definitely gotten me thinking about um, what I'd like to accomplish when I have the freedom to do so again. Um, it's uh, it's interesting how rare it is to get an opportunity to really stop and every, have everything just kind of halt um, and, and then you know, really think about, okay, well, I've gotten to this point and this has all been great and everything I've done has been great, but maybe there's a way to start to sort of shift my career towards other interests of mine after this. So, Yeah. I, everybody says, you know, like the cliche is we're going to see some really remarkable art coming out of this thing. I want to see the art that people jump on as soon as they have the opportunity to get outside of their own heads, right? It'll be like an explosion of creativity, all this pent up energy. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think a lot of people are are, are well equipped for this, and in fact, seem to be thriving. And um, you know, maybe they make music on their own, or they they you know, I've had friends shoot really great shorts just by themselves in their apartment. Um, but I also totally understand that a lot of people, it's not a very motivating time. I think people just it's it's hard not to know when this will end, and and you know what to expect. And I think it really can kill a lot of creativity, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, like you're saying, I, I'm excited to see what happens when all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but when we actually emerge at the end of this and it's like, okay, now you have all your freedom again that you took for granted before. What are you going to do with that? And I yeah. think that'll actually produce some of the more interesting art. And, of course, there's going to be a lot of art centered around the whole epidemic or, sorry, pandemic. Um, but I'm almost less interested in that. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of COVID, you know, films and, and art and that's of course valid but i'm actually excited to like i'm more interested in doing something that is completely separate from that and finally getting to not think and talk about this whole thing every yeah. single day no, um, i know exactly yeah, what i'm you excited mean. for the, that time yeah the zoom plays and the uh, isolation studies and short films those are going to be the cave paintings those are going to be the things that we emerge from and discover later they'll be the historical artifacts yeah capturing a space yeah it'll be time. more interesting when we haven't just had to suffer through it i mean i, I guess you could even say it's like you know, I'm, I don't know how to phrase it, but let's say after World War II, I'm sure there's a few years there where people didn't really want to think about it for a minute, you know, who had just suffered through it. Um, so I'm sure it'll be after the fact that then we can look back and go, wow, what a, what a wild event that was. Yeah, give us some distance. But yeah, I, I would like that distance sooner rather than later. Oh, yeah, same. I, I can't wait till it's not a thing. And and it's even funny, too, because I obsess over things, and I'm kind of fascinated by this. Subjectively, just I've never seen anything like this in my life, so I've just been following everything. And uh, my girlfriend is a saint for having to hear me talk way too much about it because, um, you know, I'll get lost in articles and 
this and that. And uh, yeah, what, hopefully there won't be a day I'm sure when when this will be a memory. That'll be nice. Until then, we we have. Uh everything we have to distract us. So yeah, um, to that end, I guess, speaking in, in terms of what will be coming from you after all this is over, I think the answer is going to be more Herzog than the film specifically, but is there anything from this particular film or Herzog's body of work in general that you will use or, or uh, steal or uh, as inspiration, borrow or work, uh, work forward in your, in your creative pursuits? Is there something in your DNA from this movie? I mean, yeah, I think, uh, again, like I said, I, I have aspirations to uh, possibly do some kind of documentary. And mm-hmm. while it obviously wouldn't be on the same subject, I think I will always use him as my main in- inspiration for anything of that ilk that I go for. Um, again, it's just the way he tells stories. It really could be about anything. Um, you know, it's still fascinating. And um So, yeah, definitely, I mean, I love storytelling, and that's why I do what I do, and I'm in this industry. Um, So I think, yeah, definitely in in my future work, for sure. And I think also just taking risks. I mean, I've been pushing over the last couple years to really make sure that everything that I do is a completely different either kind of character or genre of project. Um, I really want to push myself in the way that, you know, he, he's just all over the place in terms of genre and subject matter and, mm-hmm. and media. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of uh, where I'm at, too. I, I, I don't want to repeat myself. I, I get lots of really nice offers. It's not lots, but I get <laughs> the occasional really nice off, offer for, for a film or something, and I, I, I'll read it, and maybe it's even a great script, but I just go, you know, I have to politely decline just because I, I need to, I don't want to repeat myself anymore, and I understand why you offered me this, and it's a great opportunity, but Uh, I'd say, you know, give that opportunity to somebody else, let them have a chance. Um, But I'm looking for like that next step for me, that that different thing. So, yeah, it's such a weird place to be, isn't it? I mean, as an actor, there there is that their idea that producers only see actors as able to do the thing they want them to do, which is usually the thing they've already seen them do. So, yeah, of course, you'd be getting those offers, but it must be really frustrating. I, you know, you you're capable of. Well, I mean, you've already done so many different things, but to be seen as, you know, like we want another this or maybe this will change things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tell people all the time, look, totally understand. I don't even blame you. It's it's the human brain, of course. Okay. We need a guy or a person who fits this. Oh, there's this person who perfectly fits it. Of course, you're going to go to them first. And that's totally understandable. But I tell my friends who are on the other side of the camera all the time, I go, you know, if you really want to get a great actor, throw them something that they don't usually get. And I guarantee you'll get a better response for most actors. Like, you know, just if you give somebody a shot and try and imagine them in a completely different role, um, I guarantee they're going to be way more excited about the offer than if it's just like, okay, yeah, you're that guy. So we, you know, you fit that. But um, yeah, I think it's a really good idea if you're trying to do an indie thing and you're like, okay, we'd love to get a name so we can get funding try and go a little outside the box, you know, try and try and think of different people because you might have better luck and that'll get your movie made. So, um, yeah. Plus you get a challenge. Everybody gets to stretch a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate it a lot. I mean, like, again, all the things that I'm signed onto right now that obviously are all halted and, um, I was supposed to be shooting a film right now and that is also halted. All the things I've said yes to are a stretch for me and it's uh, a challenge and, uh, not the sole reason I would said yes to them or got the parts, but I think like, um, yeah, I think I'm in that boat for sure. But it's just, uh, I'm much more excited to do something new. I look forward to them whenever they finally happen. And, uh, yeah, you know, in between maybe, yeah, develop the documentary idea. Why not? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely easier to do on a small scale. I think that's the thing too is right now is obviously people are working very hard to figure out how we can, safely accomplish uh, shooting things on a relative scale to what we were doing before. But, you know, something like a documentary seems much more doable um, with the situation or even small scale stuff and little indies and stuff like that. I do think that is kind of cool, in my opinion, that those things actually seem much more close at hand than, than these big, giant Hollywood movies. Well. Good luck with it. It's it's good to have something to focus on on the other side of this, too. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, thank you. 
My thanks to Keir Gilchrist, who you can and should see in Castle in the Ground, available on digital and on demand in the U.S. and Canada right now. Thanks also to Winnie Wong. She knows what she did. Keir's not on Twitter, but you can find Cave of Forgotten Dreams on Blu-ray and DVD from MPI in the U.S. and Kinosmith in Canada. The MPI Blu-ray even has the 3D version included, which kind of makes it essential. It's also available on iTunes and Google Play, but only in the U.S. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com, where I'm hosting a bunch of podcasts these days. I think we're going to put four out this week. And you can find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it or you like the show, please say so. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you've been enjoying us. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network. Jordan Heath Rawlings' The Big Story remains essential listening every weekday, so, you know, it helps me cope. Stay inside, watch movies. I'll see you next week.